Hey guys, it's Tiny Tom Logan back with another video for you. Today we're going to be taking a look at the uh, upcoming Sky Mine 2 CPU cooler. I say upcoming because it's not going to be getting released uh, until the end of this month, maybe beginning of February. Sky contacted me at the tail end of last year and uh, asked me if I would take a look at this and make a video for you to, or for all the YouTubers. And uh, when they mentioned to me that it was going to be a little bit early that I get it as well, I was just, I can't turn down stuff like that. It's just like, that's that's the stuff that I really like to hear. Oh, before it actually gets officially released to the public, yes please, I'd love to. Now, uh, something that uh, I was quite surprised about was uh, the Sky, uh, this is the Mine 2, so I, I looked to see what happened with the Mine 1. And I was very surprised to find out that it was released in 2006, so quite a long time ago now. When you think about it, five years is an immense amount of time for PC components. And uh, it, it was, the mine, the original mine, was a twin tower cooler as well. So it just goes to show you that the other twin tower coolers on the market, like the famous Noctua LHD14, uh, they're not a new design, and the, the designs do go way back. But, seeing as this is a new cooler with new technology, um, I've, I've got high hopes for it really. And the trouble is, is as soon as you uh, do uh, bring out something like this now with the twin cooler, uh, pretty much everyone is instantly going to expect it to be around or about the same kind of performance as the other twin tower coolers on the market like the Silver Arrow and the D14. So to be quite honest with you, the, uh, the, the way we would expect this or want this to perform, the, the levels are, um, are massively high so it's definitely in a tough marketplace. It's not as simple as, you know, when the original mine came out that there wasn't a massive amount of choice and you pretty much I think way back then, do you know what I mean, Thermalite were pretty much holding the roost with uh, the coolers that they had out so um, it, it's, it's a very very tough marketplace now uh, there's so many coolers about and the prices are considering the performance levels that you get, the prices with the other coolers as well they're very very well placed so it's going to be a tough review for them, and it's going to be a tough review for me as well. But anyway, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you now, I did uh, made a little segment of video earlier on when I had the cooler in the light tent, uh, and I also made a little video of uh, the mounting. Uh, but then what we'll do is I'll we'll cut back, have a look at it in the system, do some uh, testing on camera, and then I'll wrap up at the end of the video and give you my personal thoughts and recommendations. Right then guys, a nice up close look at the Sky Mine. I've got it in the light tent so I've just been taking pictures of it for the main written review. As you can see we've got a total two, four, six, eight heat pipes which I'll show you down the bottom. There's two rows of four There you go, you can see there you get all eight going through, four above and four below. It's a twin tower design, very much like the, uh, the Noctua NHD14 and the Thermal Right Silver Arrow. Um, but, uh, like the Coolink Creator, which also has a similar design, this one's only got a single fan, apart from this is a single 140mm fan. Now I've already fitted the base part, which is, uh, and I've got this set up for 1366, but pretty much, if I, it, you just push one part through the selected hole that you want, and then screw it up, and then that gives you the thread, and there you can see there's a thread inside, and all then you do is these parts get pushed through your motherboard. Once it's through your motherboard, there's some rubber grommets 
basically you push the rubber grommet on and then that will hold the screw in place through your motherboard. I'll show you this actually on the motherboard in a minute. Just trying to give you a demo. So your motherboard will be here and it'll all be squidged in and then you just do it up. Like that. Job's your mother's brother. But yeah. At the end of the day, I don't really like showing you the mounts and stuff because, to be qu perfectly honest, as long as you follow the guides on all of these things, as long as it's you literally don't need an engineering degree, I don't really think there's any point in uh, mentioning it because I would hope if you're changing a heatsink on your PC, then you know what end of a screwdriver to use and I'm not going to you know, make out that you're thick or anything like that, so I think you'll be able to work it out. But there's the back plate, and it's a fairly sturdy back plate, rubber ends, foam ends actually, to go around the back of the socket, and then the uh, plastic coating. But yeah, that's pretty much all you need to see. And I just sliced my finger down at them, but I've not cut myself. There's been a few coolers I've had lately, that literally would have ripped my hand apart, but all nice clear ends. One thing I will show you, it comes with a back plate, and you can either select a PWN or the uh, switch, voltage switch, so you can have it and turn it round. So you can manually set the speed of the fan, or just set it to PWM, because it's got a PWM cable or connection for your motherboard you get a couple of options there but anyway enough of me gabbering let's actually get this thing in the rig right then guys this is just going to be a quick uh, look at the mount because it is quite fiddly I normally wouldn't show this to you I've got it already set up with the brackets on for 1366 and I've got this motherboard, yes it hasn't got a CPU in there, but it's, this, is, um, this is just to show you quickly what you need to do. Now with the back plate, you literally, you take the, the screws that come with it that I showed you earlier, and you slide it through the back plate for the, the slots that you want. Obviously I want 1366, so I'm going right at the outside. And see straight away there, they're all falling out, it's all really fiddly. But what you have to do is push it through the board, and then you get these rubber washers. Now what I'm going to do is I'll bring you in so you can have a look. Now, bear with me while I get this in the right place. Right, so we've got the screws through, and then you have to push the rubber washers over the top of the screws, right the way over right so we've got that one on now if I go this way, no we need to go this way, right there we go, got that one on so now we need to put this one on, so you just push it over right and that's what holds the screws in place okay and then what you have to do is you have to hold the heat sink over the top of the metal there we are, zoom you back out again you have to hold the heat sink over the top of the mount like that, while your motherboard's in the case, if you've got it already in there. And then from the back, you have to screw the screws at the same time. So these screws go directly into the heatsink, not a secondary bracket on the other side. And it really is quite a pain, because you can't really see where the screws are on these. So you, you kind of get them roughly lined up, and then you've got your hand around the back of the motherboard. It would be a lot simpler to mount the heatsink before you mount the motherboard. But obviously if you've already got your system together, it would mean completely taking your system apart to be able to mount it. So it's not the easiest of mounts out there. It's definitely not the type of mount that I would like to be working with regularly, um, having to take it on and off and on and off all the time. So if you're going to be uh, putting your rig together, as a new rig and leaving it you might find it's okay but if you've already got a rig or you need to take it in and out quite a lot 
you're probably going to find this quite frustrating. Right then guys, this is with the uh, cooler uh, fitted in the system. Uh, it's not as big as the D14 or the Silver Arrow, but one thing I do want to zoom in and show you. There we go. I might be able to get you in a little bit closer. It depends on whether the camera wants to play ball today. See if it will focus. It's focusing on the heat sink. If you have a look down at the um, bottom left of that ram stick you can see that it's focusing on the heat sink lovely but not actually in on the ram. Let me see if I go in a little bit further whether it will play ball. No. But anyway, you can see that it is still covering the first ram slot on the UD3 V2. But the RAM does fit underneath the cooler. It's roughly the same height as the NHD 14. So, um, uh, Corsair Dominator with the uh, tops, the removable tops, will fit underneath it. All Mushkin RAM will fit underneath it. Some G Skill will. The uh, Kingston with the without the fins on the top of the heatsink. Um, so the, the like the normal height RAM will fit. So anything with a large heat sink won't fit with this cooler but anything with reasonable size heat sinks will. As you can see it does look quite tidy in there. It's quite a mass of um, metal. I do quite like the gaps in between the uh, where the heat pipes are you can see like the two little fins going between and it's almost like you've got I mean just looking from the outside it does look like you've got eight separate blocks but it doesn't work out that way it's all together as you see in the original film but um, eight heat pipes of I can't help but think that the tops of these look like the type of valve caps that you'd have on your mountain bike or on your car did make me chuckle when I first saw that. But anyway, I want to take the camera in a little bit now, and I'll take you right off the tripod because with the fan on low, as I've shown you, you got the you get the choice where you, whether you can have it um, on PWM or you can set the fan speed yourself, which we've or I've set up at the back. With it on low, it is very quiet. And I'm quite impressed with that amount of uh, noise, but when you turn it up to maximum, it's not very quiet at all. Now other coolers with their fans at 12 volts are significantly quieter than this and the fan that's in that is 140 millimeter as well so it does move quite a bit of air but it's also making a considerable amount of noise. If I turn it back down again just so you can hear the difference. So it's pretty much a Jekyll and Hyde. When it's turned down low it's quiet, silent even, quite nice. As soon as you wang that fan up it does get quite noisy. Now noise might not uh, matter to some people but when you kind of like take everything into account it's uh, a big thing for me. Right let's get on with some testing. Right then guys, uh, take note of that bottom temperature, uh, it says 20.1 degrees C now, when I took my results which we'll be using uh, it was 19.9 degrees, if we go up to here you can see that we're running 4 gigahertz near as damn it to within 0.1 of a 
megahertz, it will flick up to 4 in a minute, it's just CPU Z not reading it right. It is set to 200 times 20 in the bars, which is 4 gigahertz. And you can see there the uh, voltage is actually set to 1.25 in the BIOS on the 950, as we always do. And you can see Prime has been running there. And if we go over, we can see. When I took my temperatures, it was 75, 73, 73, 71. That gave us an average of 73 degrees across all the cores. And then uh, if you minus the 19.9 uh, degrees ambient temperature, that gave us a 53.1 delta temperature. And that is with the uh, fan on the mine set to maximum. But what I'm going to do now is turn it down to its minimum state and uh, run the tests again. Right then guys, uh, the room's starting to warm up now where we're doing so much testing. Uh, when I took my temperatures the room was 21.9 degrees. You can see it's now just a little bit more at 22. If we scan up, we're still at 4 gigahertz and 1.25 volts. See there that Prime is still running. Zoom out a bit, you can see it's still running. And if we go over here, when it focuses, when I took my temperatures, I had 84, 82, 82, 81, which gave us an 82.25 uh, average temperature across all the cores. Uh, obviously, with the room at 21.9 degrees, that gave us a 60. Point 35 um, degrees delta so by turning the fans down to minimum the temperatures have increased by 7 degrees roughly so what we're going to do now is move on to the 4.2 gigahertz testing at 1.35 volts and see how the cooler gets on uh, with the larger amount of heat. Right then guys, just a quick flash at the uh, delta temperature there, it's 22.7. Move up here, you can see we're now running at 4.2 gigahertz. Move up a little further and uh, in the BIOS we're running at uh, 1.35 volts. You can see Prime's been running there for 30 minutes, as we do with all of our tests. And then uh, temperatures are 87, 84, 83, 82, well they were when I took my results anyway. That gives us an 84 degrees average across all of the cores. If you take the uh, ambient temperature away from that, that gives us a 61.3 degrees uh, delta temperature at 4.2 gigahertz. Right then guys, let's get this uh, review wrapped up. Now what I want to do uh, to start off with is kind of explain that with these reviews and the reason why I do them um, is I don't do it just to kind of keep pe make people happy. I do it to give you my honest opinion of a product now, sadly, sometimes this is going to mean that a manufacturer isn't necessarily going to be overjoyed with my results because I will tell it the way it is. Um, sometimes you can kind of like understand things and explain things a little bit better um, so people don't necessarily think that it's god awful when they compare lots of other factors. But sadly, uh, with the mine, and it is sad because it, I've had it early and all that kind of stuff, and I'd love it to be better than it is. Um, but sadly, when you look at the results, you've heard that it's not necessarily the quietest thing in the world. Um, it's not, especially when you look at it compared to other heat sinks, which I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, it just doesn't, it's not that, do you know what I mean? It's not that good, it's not good enough. Um, now the price uh, is going to be 50 euros. Now, uh, if it, as a direct conversion, that's £41 in the UK, which isn't a bad price. Um, 
I'm kind of expecting it to be around the 45 to 50 pounds mark by the time it gets into the UK and it gets retail, you know, goes out for retail and stuff like that. If it's less, then brilliant. Um, but one of the things that we do need to kind of point out is in many of the stores in the UK now, you can get a D14 for 60 pounds, which puts the pressure on these uh, manufacturers that are bringing out coolers like this. They really need to, if they're not up to the kind of standards of the D14, in my opinion, they need to be significantly cheaper to be able to kind of balance out the fact that your temperatures are going to be higher. Now, talking of temperatures, at 4 gigahertz with the fans on max, the, um, and don't forget, it was quite noisy at max, the mine was 53.1 delta. Now, delta is the, the important uh, word in that because that's the temperature above the ambient temperature. So it doesn't matter what the temperature of the room is, the temperature above ambient will remain relatively, do you know what I mean? It's, a, it's much better than just giving you the actual temperature, uh, the maximum temperature. But anyway, the uh, mine was 53.1. Now, if you compare that to a similarly priced Cooler Master V6 GT, that's 48.9. Now, I know a lot of you are going to go, oh, the GT has got two fans. Well, I did ask Sky to send me an extra fan and an extra set of fan clips because it doesn't come in the box with them. Sadly, they didn't. And it was something that I was hoping to do to see whether the extra fan uh, would make a difference uh, with it on low fan speeds. But obviously, they didn't. But one of the things that you have to remember is if you're... A, you buy a cheaper cooler, you then don't want to have to spend more money buying um, more fans and more fan clips and stuff like that because then you're, you're then rapidly going to get closer to the more expensive, better performing heat sinks that are already quiet anyway, even with the fans on 12 volts. Um, but yeah, so the 53.1 for the mine, 48.95 for the V6 GT, and then the D14 was 40. 0.2 degrees. So you're looking at 13 degrees difference between that and the other one. So that's almost you're paying an extra pound for an extra degree. So rather than your ambient temperature being 53, you pay an extra 15 quid and your ambient temperature drops to 40, uh, your delta temperature drops to 40 degrees. Which for me, that's not that bad a deal really, to be quite honest with you. Um, if we move up to uh, 4.2 degrees with 1.3, 4.2 degrees, 4.2 gigahertz with um, uh, 1.35 volts, so wanging the voltage up a bit more, so obviously we're going to have more heat. The uh, delta on the mine was 60.3, 61.3. The V6 GT was 59.1, but the Noctua was 50.45. So then that works out like £1.20 a degree, or £1.50, sorry, a degree. Um, so, and I don't want to keep going round and round in circles going, at the end of the day you should be buying noctures and stuff like this. I really am looking to find cheaper coolers for you guys, or it, at the end of the day even something different that can compare to uh, the Noctua NHD14 and the silver arrow depending on what clocks you're um, dependent on running but it is a massively tall order to be quite honest with you and there's not I've not found one yet that can come anywhere close to it sadly I've got to say it and as I said to you before I want to tell you out the way it is and without being overly nasty I just I, I can't I don't think that the mine really cuts the mustard um, the mounting on it is a complete pain in the arse when you have to uh, hold the heat sink in place and then screw through from the back of the board, so you're going to be like that. And the thing is, is when you've got the heat sink in one place, holding it, and then you're trying to look from the back of the board, it's really difficult to kind of match everything up. Uh, the the mounting does make it feel cheap. Um, so when it when you kind of like take everything into account. Um, I think the mount needs to be made better and simpler and probably a little bit more sturdier as well. Um, it's alright when it's on there, but it's just it's a pain in the bum when you get on there. If you're someone that takes your rig apart regularly, this cooler will drive your crackers. Um, and I think they need to... The heatsink itself might work very well, but I do think that they need to 
uh, look at different fans that are quieter because this one is just that little bit too noisy. Um, but the actual build quality of the cooler itself and everything like that, it looks amazing. I think it's really being let down by that fan. So sadly, I'm not going to recommend you to buy this at all, at least until uh, Sky change the fan, change the mount, do some of the stuff like that. But there's plenty of other coolers that you should be looking at, like the Coolink Creator, for example. Um, this, yeah, there's just too many little niggly things, the temperatures aren't that great, the fan's too noisy and the mount's really annoying. So I'm not going to drag this out any, anymore, uh, I just found this a little bit disappointing, so I'm not going to award it and I'm not going to recommend it either. So, with a, a sad kind of like, I don't like videos ending like this to be quite honest with you, but anyway, this is Tiny Tom Logan with another honest, straight down the line review for you.